pushing you away, Lord. Father, please bless us this morning. Pray this in your name, amen. I uh, once had a neat experience. I took a day trip. <clears throat> when I was living in Japan, I took a short day trip, uh, several hours by car, with two Shinto priests. And uh, Shinto is kind of like a, a nature religion. It's a religion indigenous to Japan. It has a lot of uh, uh, connections to, to nature. There's not a textbook like a Bible or the Quran. There's, there's not a text to it, but there's a lot of tradition and, and mythology and, and cultural connections to that. And, and uh, these two priests, these two Shinto priests, uh, were driving me out to see this massive tree. And I remember being in awe of the tree. And, and if you know about Japan, they tied a big rope around it, put lightning bolts on it because it was somehow a, a god of some sort or, or divine. And this tree, I can't even remember how old it was. It was well over a thousand years old. Maybe they told me it was over two thousand years old. And it was just, it wasn't so tall, but it was just really wide and, and gnarled and it looked ancient. And uh, if you know me, you know I get car sick, but so I was in the back seat and the two, two, uh, I was in the back seat with a nasty headache and the two Shinto priests sat in the front seat, but I could not miss this opportunity because I had two Shinto priests trapped in the car with me. And so uh, we talked about Jesus. And uh, I asked them if they, about their religion and if they actually believed all the, the kind of fairy tales, uh, stories that were connected with their religion. And I knew the answer already. And they said, well, no, the, the stories aren't true, but they teach good morals uh, from them. And I said, you know what? It's completely different for Christians. We believe all the miracles of the Bible. In fact, without the death in, of Jesus Christ for our sins and the resurrection from the dead, there is no Christianity. And that's what sets Christianity apart from the other religions of the world where we talk about, where we have stories that teach about good morals. Christianity hinges on the truth of the resurrection, that Jesus is not just a good teacher, not just teaching us good morals for our life, but that he's God, came in flesh because he sees our world is messed up. He sees the, the tears. He sees the pain. He sees the death. He sees the emptiness of a life lived without God. He comes down to earth. His own creation mocks him, beats on him, and rejects him. And he still says, I love you. And he gives his life. He gives his perfect life as a substitute on the cross. He takes responsibility for all our nastiness. His death, taking our punishment upon himself. And then... To show that he's not just a good guy, a cool character in history, he actually rises from the grave three days later. Does it make a difference that Jesus rose again? Does it make a difference that he just didn't come and stay dead? See, Christianity is different than any other religion because it says that God became man and he died for our sins and he rose again as, as a victor over the grave. There is no Christianity without the death and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So now let's turn to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 15. Last week we studied about the death of Jesus and how his tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards, the Roman guards, were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, which is funny. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And I always wonder if that now I have told you, is that kind of a, a Jewish first century cultural thing or was that kind of a heaven, that's the way angels talk kind of thing. Here's my mission and okay, now I did it. I don't even know why he had said that last part. Now I've told you. Uh, so the women hurried away 
from the tomb afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell the brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole away his body while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circul circulated among the Jews to this very day. <clears throat> so are these words true? Is this story true? Obviously, if it's true, you have to follow Jesus, right? And if it's not true, then he's just another character in history, maybe uh, somebody who had a lot of impact, but just another fellow in history. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians now. I want to say that our, our midweek study groups, our neighborhoods, our small groups, our cell groups, they're wonderful. If you don't have one, make sure you plug in and get one. Uh, come each week. And even if you're involved in, in, in one and that's where you're committed, you can show up at the others just to have fun sometimes. So we're going to be starting uh, 1 Corinthians in the Thursday group. And if you're free on 9.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the evening, 9.30 in the morning, what else are you doing? Come on over to Bible study. So we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul is talking. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to uh, Cephas, as Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of them, uh, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Uh, then he appeared to James, then also to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me as one abnormally born. Which, again, is just a funny thing. Uh, if you're making up this story, you don't say he appeared in front of 500 people and most of those people are still around. Uh, too easy to double-check your story. If, let's get this real simple terms today. If Jesus died on the cross, then almost one billion Muslims are following a false religion. Because Islam says that he didn't die on the cross, that he was just translated up into heaven, uh, that Jesus is coming at the end of time, the Muslims believe, to stamp out the Christian church, and Jesus at that time will die because they believe everybody has to die. And so they, they hold that Jesus has not died yet. If Jesus died, then Islam is wrong. And there's a billion people, or almost a billion people, who are missing out on what God has for them. And they need to, they need to open their eyes and turn and embrace the love and forgiveness of God. If, secondly, if Jesus rose from the dead then atheism, even secularism, is wrong. Any, any worldview that, that does not encompass the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's wrong. If Jesus rose from the dead, you need to reconcile your life with that fact. You need to get a hold of it. And the third question is, if these words we just read are true, what are you going to do about it? If this is true, Jesus Christ's death on the cross and resurrection, what are you going to do about it? To answer these questions, I, I want to first do away with this myth that you can't quote the Bible to tell you anything about the life of Christ. You ever heard that? How convenient if you're Satan. Uh, let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, you, but you can't quote from the Bible. Well, that, how does that make any sense at all? How does that, let's say your only information about Aaron Rodgers was a Sports Illustrated article. And somebody says, tell me about Aaron Rodgers, because they're on some island, they don't have TV or something. Well, let me quote from you from this Sports, but you can't quote from that. Why not? Well, there is no reason why not. This is a myth that you can't quote from the Bible to talk about the life of Christ. That would be like saying you can't, 
You can't just quote Caesar's Gaelic Wars to tell you anything about Caesar or his wars in Gaul. Well, why not? Seriously. But actually, there's less reason to believe in, in uh, Caesar's Gaelic Wars because the first copies we have are, are hundreds of years after the case. But it's supposed to be a contemporary account, and it would be silly, it would be silly to say we can't study about Caesar by studying his book, The Gaelic Wars. It would be silly. And there's really no reason to say we can't know anything about Jesus if you want to talk from the Bible. That, that's just wrong. Uh, actually, it's even worse than that for that perspective. It's really not quite the same, Caesar's Gaelic Wars in the Scriptures, because the New Testament is not one book. Caesar's Gaelic Wars is one book by one author. The New Testament is 27 separate books written over a period of time by multiple authors that were gradually coalesced and brought together into one uh, book we call the New Testament. And these authors, many of them knew Christ personally, and others just did research and told about what they learned. They often wrote about the same events, but from different perspectives. And so you have a book that's 27 different books by multiple authors written over different periods of time, talking about the same events from different points of view, and you're going to tell me, but you talk about Jesus, but you can't quote from that. Well, that's, that's just silly, and I'm not going to turn off my brain in order to talk to you about Jesus. So yes, we are going to use contemporary accounts because it only makes sense. So we not only have the witnesses in the New Testament, but we have the cross-references as well as you look like at events like the resurrection from multiple, point of views, uh, multiple points of view. Uh, we also have many letters <coughs> roughly from that time period written by Jews, Greeks, and Romans, again, from this time period, and they themselves are quoting from Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John. Most of their quotes come from books. When they were writing, there was nothing called the New Testament. Most of their quotes are found in our New Testament. Every once in a while, they quote uh, Peter, Paul, <coughs> Jesus, and John, and we don't have those quotes in the New Testament. That I don't consider that the Bible. Those may or not be accurate qu quotes. Even if they were true quotations, God did not see fit to have it in Scripture. But isn't it cool that people from the early church, the first one, two, three generations of Christians, we have letters that they wrote for one another before the New Testament was even put together. They're quoting from Paul said, Peter said, Jesus said. And of course, it corroborates everything we have in the Scripture. So you have these 27 books, then you have all these many other. In fact, it's been said that if you just took the first several generations of pastors, the letters they wrote to one another, if this book disappeared today, you could take their letters, and whenever they're quoting from the New Testament, you could put it together, and you'd have almost the entire New Testament quoted by these early pastors if the book disappeared today. So let's do away with the myth that you can't, the Bible isn't reliable. It's confirmed by contemporary sources. Let's do away with the myth that you can't quote from the Bible when we're talking about Jesus. That doesn't even make sense. And, and we don't do that with any book other than the Bible. Every other old ancient book, we study to learn about the people mentioned in the book. Then we come to the Bible and say, you can't use the Bible. Well, no, I'm not going to cooperate with Satan. Why would I do that? Of course I can use the Bible. It's an ancient contemporary account. That doesn't mean that you have to believe it's from God. I do, and we can get to that. But it's ridiculous just to throw out a 2,000-year-old book talking about a character who lived 2,000 years ago. Silly. I really want to say that. That's double silly. There, there's just no reason, and yet people are always saying that. <clears throat> Real quick, one example of an ancient guy we have is, is Clement, and he's called Clement of Rome. And he was writing early in the history of the church, and he was describing Old Testament men who suffered for their faith. And he's talking about Abel, and he's talking about Moses and David. He's talking about people who suffered for their faith. Listen to this. But then he writes in his, his uh, letter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, But let us pass from ancient examples and come to those who have in the times nearest to us wrestled with their faith. Let us take the noble example of our own generation. So he says, we know the Old Testament guys suffered for their faith. Who are the, he says, let's talk about people from our own time period, our own generation. And he goes on to talk about Peter and Paul suffering for their faith. And then he talks about two women we don't have in the Bible called 
Danides in, in Circe, who, who died for their faith. And it's just so cool, this guy writing before the New Testament is even done being written. And he's saying, people who have suffered for their faith, and he names these, giving these Old Testament examples. <clears throat> and he says, but let's talk about some examples from our own generation. He talks about Peter and Paul and some other people that we, we don't know about except from his letters. In, in the same writing, which was a letter to the church in Corinthians, which is cool, right? So he knew pa about Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and in his letter he says, my letter is not like Paul's letter. <laughs> Paul, Paul had this great wisdom, and, and uh, he said, my, you guys asked me to write a letter, so I wanted to write you a letter. So Clement of Rome writes in, in chapter 7, verse 3 of his letter to the Corinthians, let us consider what is good and pleasing and acceptable before him who made us. Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ. The idea that Christ died and bled for our sins, which the Quran says didn't happen, which many modern people somehow pick out of the air and say that didn't happen. The people of that generation said, oh yeah, that happened. Does it matter? Who are you going to put more weight to? Some guys sitting on television saying, I don't believe Jesus really died on the cross. Or people who said, we're of this generation, and he, they said, let's think about the blood of Christ. They're much closer, much closer to the actual events. And see how precious in the sight of God is the blood of Christ. Sound familiar? Isn't that what we're still talking about today? Oh, precious is the blood, which having been poured out for our salvation, Wait, haven't you heard on television somebody flip on the TV and somebody say the idea that Christ wasn't just a good teacher but that he died for our sins, that developed over a long period of time or hundreds of years. you got to be able to say crap. When you see television, when you see some guy who's talking about something like that, you got to think either, either he just don't know what he's talking about and why the heck is he on TV, or this guy knows and he's being tricky. He's a liar. Because he can open up the book of Clement to Corinthians, same as all of us can. And he can read a contemporary account where early in the Christ history of the church, before the New Testament was even finished being written, they're talking about the blood of Christ was given for our salvation. Of course, it says that in the Bible, too. But a lot of people say you can't use the Bible. So that's why I'm using these other sources. Not, his, his words are not the Bible, right? But I'm using it to show that at the same time the Bible's being written, other sources are talking about it as well. And then he goes, uh, let us consider what is good and pleasing and acceptable for uh, him who made us. Let us look steadfastly at the blood of Christ and see how precious in the sight of God is blood, which having been poured out for our salvation, brought to the whole world the grace of repentance. Clement then goes on to talk about the resurrection. Again, have you heard? The idea of Christ raising from the dead was a later addition to Christianity. If you've, if you've watched the History Channel or some television news show, you've heard people say that. And again, they're ignoring either because they don't know and they're lazy or uh, because they're tricky. And uh, Clement calls the resurrection of Christ the first fruit of all who will rise from the grave who put their faith in Christ. See, the, the generation of Christians that lived at the same time as the apostles believed that Christ has died for their sins. That didn't change, did it? We're still, 2,000 years later, we believe Christ died for our sins. Now, this doesn't prove that Clement was correct. I mean, there's people contemporary today making all sorts of opinions, and they, they're wrong. But it does show you the nasty myth, the lie, that the death and resurrection of Christ were things that gradually evolved and were added later. And why would anybody say that? It makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. If I want to be fair, intellectually honest, I would say, yeah, these, the New Testament was not written hundreds of years later. That was written at that time period. We've, we've got it corroborated by letters written at that time. And yeah, people of that time period, many people at that time period, believed what the New Testament says, but I don't believe it. And that's intellectually fair. But why the dishonesty to, to put up these lies and then say, when you know it's wrong? when it's historically inaccurate. Well, that seems a little diabolical to me, literally. Uh, there's other reasons to believe that Christ, in fact, did die on the Roman cross. Uh, here he is, he makes this big splash in history, and then he's gone. Actually, it's even more interesting than that. He didn't make such a big splash. 
until his death was public in Jerusalem during the time of Passover. And then shortly after that, he, he's gone. Huge impact here, and then he's gone. Well, there's three different uh, theories. One, uh, believed by the contemporary people, uh, believers and non-Christians in the time of Christ. Believers and non-Christians, Jews, Romans, everybody. The theory, you want to hear the, the main theory at that time? Why did Jesus disappear from history like that? Because everybody thought he died. It's not that tricky. Everybody thought he died. The Christians thought he died on the cross. The Jews thought he died. The Romans thought he died. But 600 years later, the Quran declares that he didn't die on the cross. In Surah 4, it says that they said in their boasting, we killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Miriam, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them and those who differ there and are full of doubts with no certain knowledge and only conjecture to follow for a surety, they killed not him. Uh, nay, Allah raised him up into himself, and Allah is exalted in power wise. Uh, in other words, it only looked like Jesus. It appeared to be. They thought they killed somebody, but it wasn't Jesus. So I don't know whether they killed an illusion. Uh, there's different schools of thought in Islam, or, or whether Allah described, uh, dis, you know, made a face so somebody some poor guy died and people thought he was Jesus. Uh, this is really important. Who did the tricking? It was Allah here in this story. If Allah ch just tricked people into thinking Jesus died on the cross, one, he did a great job. Praise be to Allah because everybody thought that Jesus died on the cross. Now, 600 years later, Muslims are trying to tell us, no, he didn't really die. They only thought he died because they were tricked. Well, they, the tricking was excellent because the, the, his, his own disciples thought he died, and then when he rose again, they were stunned. The, the people wanted to kill him, thought he was dead. They nailed him to the cross, and when they were going to break his legs, they found he's already dead. They stabbed him with a spear in his side, and he was dead. So that was a really good trick. But then you've got to ask yourself, why would Allah, God, why would God... Uh, a lot of Christians in the Middle East call Allah, Allah el Ab, which means a God the Father, uh, Ab like Abba, right? Uh, of course, Muslims hate that because they don't want to believe in the Trinity. There is no El Ab. Why would you call the fa uh, Allah God? But just, just so you know that the word Allah is the word for God in, in that language. Uh, Allah, in that case, deceived God, deceived thousands of Christ Jesus' followers to the point that they were willing to die because they believe Jesus died for their sin. Well, who's responsible for that trick? It would have been God. You've got to wonder why he would do that. Uh, then Jesus rose again to life, thus assuring that they too would live again. This is what they believed. This is huge. There is no evidence at the time of Christ to support this idea that he didn't die on a Roman cross. If Jesus died on the cross, then Islam is utterly false. If Jesus died on the cross, that religion is not a competitor with Christianity. It's a false doctrine. The third uh, theory, popular among uh, new, some New Agers today, so the first theory was that, why do people think he died on the cross? Because he died on the cross. Second theory uh, is that he really didn't die. God tricked the people to think. And they were so proud they thought they killed the Messiah, but they were only deceived and he really didn't die. The third theory, popular among some New Agers today and, and some uh, people that like speculative theories. You know, there's a whole cottage industry. There's a whole industry of people who, when you think time, sometimes it's freaky, Jesus was, you know, teleported by aliens or whatever. Uh, there's, there's people who spend money on this. It, it, as long as it's different than this, they can go, ooh, you know. Uh, it's, something, it's something mysterious, and they can get into it. So there, there's a third uh, theory popular today that Jesus knew yoga, and he slowed his heart rate down and actually survived the cross and the spear in his side. And after he recovered, he ran away to India and lived out his days there. Now, again, just like the Quran, there's no proof. Okay, there's no proof. 
but people get on TV to talk about this stuff. So the vast majority, I mean, not the vast majority, everybody thought Jesus was dead. <laughs> that's what the Christians and the non-Christians both agreed on. Now, him raising from the dead, that's a different matter. If you believe Jesus rose from the dead, uh, most of those people became Christians, uh, but not all, which is interesting. But uh, there is no proof for, for what the Quran says or what the New Agers say, these ideas that came much later. Uh, question. What one entity in the entire universe or multiverse wishes he could erase what Christ did on the cross? Could it be Satan? For you older guys? If I didn't want to believe in Christianity, I'd just say I don't believe what the Bible says. I believe that I wouldn't believe in the resurrection. Why all this doubt on his death? Because on the cross, he paid for our sins, and the devil can't stomach that. And so not only do we have to deny the resurrection, we've got all these people denying he even died on a cross, which is, again, just silly. I heard a guy on television one time says, the Romans were, were uh, a military fighting un uh, unit. They would not have wasted good metal on nails hammered into people on the cross. Therefore, Jesus didn't die on the cross. So we've got some guy, modern guy, saying Jesus couldn't have died on the cross because the Romans would not have wasted metal. And we've got these ancient accounts talking about the cross. Well, guess what? You can go on the internet and you can look up nails from Roman crosses. You can see photos of nails from Roman crosses that we've dug up. I, there was one, we even know something more the Bible didn't say. They'd hammer the nail through, and then on the backside, they'd bend the nail so that it wouldn't pull out. I, do, I know this not from the Bible. I know this from a scientist digging stuff up out of the ground. So when a guy starts sounding really wise, the cross could not have happened because Romans would never have wasted metal like that. You say, well, why does he know better? Don't you think the people at the time when the Bible was written would have said, whoa, 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 whoa. There was never any nails in Roman crosses. They would not be. If, it was, if the people at the time believed it, why should we believe this guy who gets on television, especially when you can Google it on the Internet and see Roman nails from that time period? Again, we've got to stop being silly. We want to get along with people so well, but if the price to pay is to throw away your brain, that's a price too high. Don't do that. Other factors to consider, his enemies wanted him dead. They made sure he was dead. They put a spear in his side. Later, his enemies claimed that the body had been stolen. They never claimed that he didn't die. Wouldn't that be a good thing to do if a guy's walking around, if a lot of people are claiming he was alive? I mean, they had to claim the body was stolen because they didn't have the body, right? But you might as well have said, well, he didn't really die. He, he revived himself, but that's not what they said. It even paid people to say that the body was stolen. Another factor to consider, if Jesus didn't really die on the cross, why would his followers claim he had? You ever think about that? Think about this. You are in the first century, you're in first century Rome, greatest empire on the planet. And some guy is trying to convince you that a Jew, despised minority, a Jew is God. And the Roman government hammered him to a Roman cross, which is a punishment for criminals. And he's God. Wait, my government nailed that Jewish God to a cross? That's not what you lead with. If you want to make a popular religion, you don't take a despised minority group and have the God you're writing about. When you're competing with Zeus and Thor and all these guys, you don't say, and then the government grabbed him and nailed him to a cross. What? That doesn't even make any sense. If you are inventing a religion, and why would you do that? Maybe to get money, popularity, sex, I don't know. If you're inventing a religion, you don't, you don't make one where uh, your God dies on a, on a Roman cross. That, doesn't, that didn't go over well with the Jews themselves, by the way. They didn't want God to die on a Roman cross. So you can't reach out to the Jews. It was ridiculous to Greek philosophers. God would allow himself to die? That doesn't make sense. He's the greatest of the great. Why would he allow, why would he come down, humble himself, and be nailed to a cross. And the Romans who believe in might and glory 
are not naturally inclined to believe. So you're not going to get the Jews, you're not going to get the Greeks, you're not going to get the Romans. Who would just make up a story where Jesus died on the cross unless, you know, we got to say it that way because he did die on the cross. Does that make sense? Does that ever make sense with everybody? In other words, no one would invent a religion where a Jew dies on a bloody Roman cross and we're supposed to believe that he was God. The only way this is part of the story of Christ is because it's true. And the entire New Testament is written around the truth of Christ's death and resurrection. And people, people will die for a lie all the time if they think it's true. If people think a lie is true, they'll die for it. But if people knew he didn't really die on that cross, if they knew he didn't really rise from the dead, why did so many of them die for that lie, give their lives to that lie? What were they getting out of it? They got the privilege of being beaten and kicked out of cities, losing their businesses, having their families dragged away as they went from city to city telling them, God loves you and you can be forgiven for your sin. And they were, they were brutally abused for this message. They got nothing out of it. They believed that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and that gave them the courage to go everywhere talking about the love of God. And again, we have extra-biblical uh, texts attesting uh, that this was not a late invention. This did not come about later. Ignatius, this guy named Ignatius, was a disciple of Peter and John. And he wrote between 800 and 100 A.D. So again, the last book in the New Testament wasn't even written yet. Or, or was maybe in the process of being written. So Ignatius, a disciple of Peter and John, uh, wrote, There is only one who is both flesh and spirit, born and unborn, from Mary and from God, God and man, first subject to suffering, and then beyond it, true life and death. He's talking about the deity of Christ. He's talking about the death of Christ. He's talking about the resurrection of Christ before the New Testament is even done being written. You will hear, hear people get on TV and say all this stuff developed later. And you got to call it for what it is. I call crap. I see it. It's garbage. It's wrong. Uh, he wrote also, We are chosen through true suffering by the will of the Father and Jesus, the Messiah, our God. Again, divinity of Christ, not a late development. Polycarp, a disciple of, of the Apostle John and a friend of Ignatius, wrote, He who raised Jesus from the dead, you know, because he believed it, will raise us if we do his will and walk his commandments and love what he loved. Polycarp wrote many letters, but we only have one left, which was uh, actually neat because it was a cover letter. And it was sent of a collection of the writings of his friend Ignatius. So that first guy I wrote, told you about, a disciple of Peter and John. Ignatius wrote a bunch of letters. Uh, and Polycarp was writing to a church uh, in Philippi, and he said, uh, his letter that we still have is, was like the cover letter. He said, I'm including all of Ignatius' letters for you, too. And they were sitting this at the same time that the New Testament is still being put together. Uh, I'm going to read the first couple paragraphs uh, from Polycarp's letter, and I want you to notice two exciting things, exciting for me anyways. Uh, first, the man who studied under John and had a, friend, uh, had a friend, Ignatius, who was taught by John and Peter, at this early date in his, uh, Christian history, he affirms the same beliefs we have today. And there's a, a famous uh, a scholar, he studied at Wheaton, he gave up his faith, he's very hostile to Christianity, uh, and uh, he's no longer a believer, and he writes about Christ all the time, he says Jesus is not God, but you know what he says? If you took away every piece of scripture that's in doubt in the New Testament, very little would be taken away, and every central core doctrine of Christianity would still remain. Yeah, he's right about that. And so it's not, a, it's not surprising that these early Christians had the same beliefs that we have today. It's not something that, th this is hundreds of years before the Council of Nicaea. There's, there's two magic wands you hear non-Christians use. One is called Dead Sea Scrolls, and they wave this around like a magic wand. The other one is Council of Nicaea. And, and then once you say Dead Sea Scrolls or Council of Nicaea, they're supposed to cast in doubt everything about Christianity. The Dead Sea Scrolls have to do with the Old Testament. As soon as somebody starts talking about the New Testament, we can't believe the New Testament because Dead Sea Scrolls. You know already that they don't know what they're talking about. Or they're being intentionally tricky because Dead Sea Scrolls only deal with the Old Testament. Council of Nicaea is hundreds of years after we have all this information that I've been quoting to you today. So stop waving. I'm going to break that little magic wand. That's, it's just silly. It's silly again. And we have to stop being silly because these issues are way, 
way too important. Uh, so hundreds of years before the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, he clearly quotes several times from books that are later found in the New Testament. Listen, Polycarp and the elders with him to the church of God sojourning in Philippi, mercy to you and peace from God Almighty and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, be multiplied. Isn't that a beautiful letter written at the time when the New Testament is still being put together? I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ because you have followed the example of true love as displayed by God and have accompanied uh, as becomes you those who are bound in chains the fitting ornaments of the saints. Now that's a sad verse. He said a lot of you were put in chains. That's fitting ornaments for a Christian, he says. Which are indeed the diadems, the crowns of the true elect of God and our Lord and, uh, and because the strong root of your faiths uh, spoken of in the days. So he's talking about how Christians, we know your faith is true because you're in chains because of it. A lot of you have been taken away by the Roman government. So then he says, the strong root of your faith spoken of in, in days long gone by, he's talking about a couple decades earlier, uh, Philippians 1, 5, when Paul says, whole world's rejoicing because of your faith. And he says, you know, in, in the days past, your faith, your faith was exalted and it still endures. He says, endures even until now and brings forth fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered even unto death. Isn't that cool? That's a church that's several decades old. It's not, no longer the new church that Paul started. This church is decades old at this point. He said the same faith that Paul was saying, way to go, guys. Your faith is still shining bright today. Wouldn't you like that to be true of us? Decades later. And then look what he wrote. What he wrote. Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered even unto death. Again, this is not a late evolution of Christianity. These are not myths that cropped up over time. This is right here at the beginning. But whom God raised from the dead, having loosed the bands of the grave, and whom through now you see him not, though now you see him not, you believe, and believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, which is, of course, 1 Peter 1, 8. So he's quoting from Paul, now he's quoting from Peter. Into which joy many desire to enter, knowing that by grace you are saved, not of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. He's quoting from Ephesians chapter 2. You can believe your Bible. Later in the letter, he again quotes from Ephesians, and listen to this, he calls it scripture. Well, that's okay, because Peter, in the, in the New Testament, Peter calls the writings of Paul scripture as well. So right away, the church knew this is a prophetic voice. We're going to keep a hold of these things. And you know, nobody ever thought Clement or, or Polycarp, nobody ever thought their stuff was scripture. They're good letters, but nobody thought they were scripture. The early church believed Christ died, and they believe he rose from the dead, and that's really weird because, think about it, people don't rise from the dead. But they believed it. If the Bible taught that Jesus rose, think about this. If the Bible had said Jesus died on the cross and his spirit rose alive and the apostles saw his ghost and his ghost came to speak to them, but his body stayed in the grave, probably you and I would still be here today. Probably we'd still be here. And we'd say, yeah, we have all those witnesses, all those witnesses who were willing to die because they believe Jesus rose again spiritually and we know our spirit will be alive too. But they didn't say that. That would have been the smart thing. If you're making up a religion, don't lie that he rose from the grave if all the other people have to do is say, hey, you know, we got the body over here. They could have said he rose spiritually, and I would have believed it if they had, if they had given their lives for it and all the changes happened because of it, the way, the, way, the, way, if the rest of the story played out the way it did. But that's not what they did. The early Christians didn't claim that it was a spiritual resurrection. They claimed that Jesus rose bodily from the grave. After Jesus died on the cross, the apostles and the rest of his small band of followers, just a small group when Jesus died, they were scattered. They were depressed. They didn't know what to do. Then something happened, and it galvanized them, and it empowered them. It encouraged them. They took on the Roman Empire. They went all over the known world. Uh, the, the Thomas, doubting Thomas, 
went to India and died in India telling people about Jesus. They went all over the known world telling people about the good news of the gospel, that there is a God, that God loves you, that God will forgive you. They claim they met and were taught by the resurrected Jesus Christ. And if that were not true, all the governing officials in Jerusalem had to do was produce the body and presto, no Christianity today. If you're going to lie, you don't want to make a lie that's so easy to catch you in. Of course, again, if they were lying and they had stolen the body, why'd they go everywhere talking to people about love and forgiveness and then die for that message when they knew that Christ didn't die and didn't raise again? If, if that's what was the truth. Nobody had the body. <laughs> and all these people believed the weird thing that he rose from the grave because, well, for one, he appeared to 500 people at one time. He appeared to people all over the place. He was teaching them over a period of many weeks. He, he was coming and, and talking to them, and they all were absolutely convinced that Jesus uh, died and rose again. And the bad guys, the guys that hated Jesus, they didn't say, well, he appeared to die and he didn't die. Or they didn't say, well, the apostles are just lying. We've got the body. He just, he just spirit, uh, they, they, it was a spiritual resurrection or whatever. They wanted to spread the rumor that somehow the apostles came and the Roman soldiers, who have to guard something on penalty of death, by the way, that the Roman soldiers just all fell asleep. The big stone was rolled away. They snuck out with the body. That's a pretty desperate lie. Why did they tell it? That's all they had. That's all they had. So why don't we believe in the resurrection? What do we have? So in this way, the enemies of Christ, with the spear in his side, with the, with the checking to see if he's dead on the cross, with the putting the guard around the tomb, in this way, the enemies of Christ give a better witness to the miracle of his resurrection. Thank God for the enemies. And what again, what was this message that they were willing to die for? Was it conquest? Was it revenge? No, it was love, it was grace, it was mercy. Another interesting consideration, the first witnesses were women. You say, big deal. In that first century culture, this is not going to go over well with some of the ladies. Everybody awake? In that first century culture, women were not allowed to give their testimony in court. Isn't that weird? So if you're going to make up a story about Jesus rising from the grave, why would you say, and the first people that saw him were women, when a lot of men at that time are going to go, Shh, yeah, yeah, I know all about that. Why would you say that if their testimony was not valid in the court of law? Why would you say that? Why would you make up that part of the story unless it was true? That's the kind of detail, again, that you only put in there if it's true. And then there's the record of Saul Paul. Remember, Saul was going everywhere, uh, killing Christians, dragging them off to jail, voting for the death penalty. He was feared, and he met the resurrected Jesus Christ. He utterly changed, and he was willing to die for Jesus. How do you explain that without the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And ever since, Paul was transformed by Jesus. And ever since, from prisoners to, to, to the deepest, darkest jungles, to, to elite scholars in our, in, in our major universities across the world, to average people like you and I, People's lives have been touched and transformed by the resurrected Jesus Christ because there's power in the name of Jesus, and Jesus changes things. Lord Darling, who was a former Lord Chief Justice of England, he asserted, in its favor as a living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. Anthony Flew, by the way, who does not believe in the resurrection, he's at one time, well, he might now, I hope he, well, he does now, but I hope he's in heaven. He at one time was a leading proponent of atheism, uh, who gradually became a deist. There may be some evidence that he was open to Christianity at the end. I hope he took that step. He did not believe in the resurrection, okay? But he had to grudgingly admit, and here's his quote, this famous atheist, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for the claimed miracles in any other religion. It is outstandingly different in quality and quantity. 
No, he was just being intellectually honest. I want you to think about this. There's one miracle that's changed the world. Okay, there's one supposed miracle that's changed the world more than anyone else. That's the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus has changed the culture, the direction of planet Earth, the population of the world. And it just so happens by some chance or circumstance to be the one miracle that has the most supporting evidence of any miracle ever. That's amazing coincidence. Remember we talked about in the Old Testament that, that uh, God chose Abraham. And he said, your descendants are going to be numerous. And your descendants are going to bless and change the whole world. And just by chance and circumstance, if you trace down the line of Abraham all the way to Jesus, that one guy, his family has changed the world more than any other family. You could have chose a family in Norway, a family in Ch southern China, a family in, the Incan, uh, in, in, the, in Peru in the Incan culture. There's nobody whose family has changed the world like Abraham's family. And the Bible said that thousands and thousands of years ago, and just by chance it happened to be true. Then the Bible said that the nation of Israel would be scattered and brought back together and scattered. Brought, and wow, uh, the only nation in the history of the world that's ever been done to is Israel. And then we have all the prophecies of Jesus, that he would be a suffering servant, that he would be disfigured, that he would be lifted up, and that by his death, everybody would be healed and find salvation. And there's only one person that those words fit, and that would be Jesus Christ. And then we have this one miracle in history that even a, an atheist had to grudgingly say, wow, this is outstandingly, there's a lot of quality and quantity here for this. That, that Lord Darling says, no jury could fail to, conv to, to, to bring in the verdict, the resurrection is true. And that's the one miracle that transformed the world. And then Jesus, who had a small group of followers, was talking about how he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all people. And today, in every single country in the world, in every people group in the world, there's at least some Christians. Nothing has gone out into the world like this. And when Christ said those words, he just had a few guys in one corner. Amazing coincidence, coincidence, coincidence. Or it is the hand of God working in history, and you better get right with a God who loved you enough to come down to earth to die for your nastiness, and then rose again in power, and heaven is waiting for you. And you want to say thank you. You want to say thank you. We're studying in a Sunday school class. We've got one week left, a book by Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, uh, who many of you know was involved in Watergate, and he was thrown in prison for the stuff that was going on with President Nixon. And Listen to what he wrote. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. <laughs> How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it wasn't, weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world in the United States. And they couldn't keep the same lie going for three weeks. <laughs> You're telling me the 12 apostles could keep a lie going for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And many millions of people in all walks of life around the world today have heard the message of the death and resurrection, no matter what their education level, no matter what their income level, no matter what their culture, and their lives have been completely changed by putting their hope in Jesus Christ. In fact, if the resurrection is a lie, then no other lie in the history of the world has brought so much transformation of individual people and of entire cultures. This is the big lie of the world. No other lie ever inspired so much goodness. No other lie inspired so much selflessness or, redemptive or redemption of wayward lives. In other words, the story of the death and resurrection of Christ, if it were a lie, it is of such a monumental lie, such stunning effect, that it would not only be the greatest deception in history, it would be a lie worthy of a god. So three things to think about. If Jesus died on the cross, Islam is a false religion. And he did die. That's what all the contemporary record says. If Jesus rose, then atheism, secularism, secularism is not tenable. If he rose, got to give up on it. Lastly, if Jesus died and rose again, my friend, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live your life? What's going to be important to you? What happens from this moment on? Amen.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.